This video is brought to you by Squarespace. I used to be web blind, but now I have website. When last we saw our beloved Imperial China, it was, hmm, let's check, uh, unified, broken, fixed, very briefly broken, fixed again for a while, and then it broke again at the end. This video will strike a perhaps alarmingly similar tune throughout the first millennium AD. In order to get a closer look at China's pathological inability to maintain the status quo for more than a century, but this time with positive numbers for the years, let's do some history. As the Han Dynasty clearly lost favor at the end of the second century AD, the proverbial deer was loose, and Heaven's Mandate was roaming free, just waiting to get bambied. The period of disunion that followed the Han implosion saw three main competitors vie for power. The North Northern Wei, the Southeastern Wu, and the Southwestern Shu. The aptly named Three Kingdoms period dominated the 3rd century, and we're lucky enough to have a fairly helpful, if romanticized, historical account of the period. And since I don't do so hot with stories, let's check in with Red for a breezy summary of the famed Romance of the Three Kingdoms. Oh, hey, Blue. Hiya, Red. How goes the, uh, super brief rundown of the Three Kingdoms? Nope, this bad boy is dense. I'm gonna need more time. Took me three days just to get through the table of contents. Hmm, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, in that case, I'll hop on back to the video. Oh, by the way, I uh, just finished watching Avatar the other week. Oh, nice. How'd you like it? It was amazing. Zuko's redemption arc, am I right? The trope talks make so much more sense now. Anyway, later. Later, dude. So, in record time, the Shu and Wu kingdoms to the south usually allied against the Northern Wei in their century-long fight for Chinese supremacy. Their famous Battle at the Red Cliffs saw a ragtag flotilla of southern ships sail in the middle of the night towards the much larger Wei fleet that was docked across the Yangtze River. The southern navy promptly jumped overboard and set their vessels aflame, careening into the Wei fleet and basically sacking it instantly. And I say that is pro strats at work. Sun Tzu would be very proud. It was basically a lot of that with no territorial movement for 60 years. The fighting happened as much on battlefields as it did in royal courts vying for the grandest culture, and continued later on in the competing histories written centuries afterwards. The somewhat fictionalized novelization of the period follows the Wu Kingdom, which famously did not win the actual fight part. But the story itself was likely written for the Ming Dynasty some 1200 years later to support their own political agenda. Because if you learn nothing else from this channel, remember that authors are persistent, but also so petty as hell. In the end, the Northern Wei Kingdom turned Jin Dynasty one out and breathed a nice, heavy sigh of relief right before infighting and usurpation made everything go back to poof. The Jin Dynasty relocated southeast as the north splintered into 16 separate kingdoms. Ha! Ah! This is why we can't have nice things. <sighs> This era often gets treated like a less interesting and more confusing Warring States period, as in it gets completely ignored. But there's more to it than a frankly absurd looking map. It's here that Taoism and especially Buddhism took hold of Chinese thought. And also, fun fact, the poetry of the era was absolutely top notch. This beautiful mess helped forge the distinct blend of Confucianism, Buddhism, and Taoism that would come to define classical Chinese religion for centuries. That's a cool thing! People don't talk about it enough. While the Abrahamic faiths can obviously coexist in a society, they're pretty much mutually exclusive to actually practice. By contrast, medieval Chinese scholars and laymen found no issue with acting like a Taoist, praying like a Buddhist, and thinking like a Confucian. These three grew to not only tolerate, but complement each other, both within a kingdom and within individual people. Buddhism had originated several centuries prior over in India and underwent a minor transformation when it integrated into China. Instead of putting focus on escaping the cycle of reincarnation, Chinese Buddhism prioritized spiritual enlightenment, an angle that meshed a little more naturally with the local philosophies already in place. We'll check back in on this a little later, but for now, let's return to the intrinsically inconstant state of Chinese politics. In the south, Nanjing became the cultural and civic capital of the six successive southern dynasties, say that five times fast. In the north, between the 16 kingdoms and a whole lot of capitals being sacked by outside invaders, the dominant military strategy became cavalry as the northern way cemented themselves as the region's head honcho. But this didn't help them fight the navy-heavy south, so for another century they just kind of stared at each other, both functionally invulnerable but completely unable to even slightly poke at the other. In the end, it was the Sui dynasty who swept in to conquer everything. Why did they succeed when everyone else failed? I'll be honest, I don't really know, but I also do know not to look a gift empire in the mouth, so I say we run with it. 
As rulers, the Sui were a mixed bag. While they instituted a Taoist and Confucian-styled Buddhism as the official religion, they were also pretty despotic in how they governed. They tried to build a canal system through the heart of the empire to boost trade, but they didn't treat the workers all that great, so they revolted and the dynasty collapsed, being swiftly replaced by the Tang Dynasty. And if that name sounds familiar, it's because these guys actually kept it together for more than 20 minutes. The Tang got going by consolidating their territory and polishing up their infrastructure. And rather than giving in to their own grand imperial whims, the Tang seemed to have a strong tradition of actually listening to their advisors. What a concept! Early Tang history seems to show that things were good. The state was organized well, so food was in stable supply, and famines were avoided thanks to surpluses. As such, fewer people resorted to banditry out of desperation, and travel across the empire was substantially easier and safer. Sometimes history has really good domino effects, too. I know. Shock. They also went to great effort to chart the messy succession and overlapping of dynasties from the fall of the Han to the rise of the Sui, instituting an office of historiography to constantly compile and create works of history. And I can say on behalf of the entire historical community and my own personal sanity, we really appreciate that. Thank you. These works were more formulaic than those of a singular genius like Suma Xian, sure, but at least we have the history in the first place, so baby steps. As the first Tang Emperor consolidated China and reformed the judicial system to make it a little less murdery, the second Emperor pushed the Tang territory to its greatest extent, while also prioritizing overall quality of life improvements for the average citizen. Those are tough acts to follow, but ever exciting, Chinese history has a surprise in store for us in the form of Wu Zetian. And since biographies aren't really my thing, <laughs> Whoops. Uh, I'm bringing in a modern Plutarch to take us on a trip, Mr. Jack Rackham. Hiya, Jack. Hey, Blue. Pleasure to be here. I can't tell you how much I appreciate you giving up your monetization to have me. My what now? Oh, yeah, the life of Wu Zetian's a killer story. It's got affairs and murder and torture and pet okay. I'm just gonna get started now before you change your mind. Once upon a time, there was a little girl in a noble family whose father loved her very much. Unlike other little girls, she was encouraged to read and learn as much as she could. And one day, when she was 14, he shipped her away to be the Emperor's concubine, and she probably never saw him again. It has been a while since I've read my Confucius, but that sounds like exceptionally terrible filial piety. Now, to be fair, being the Emperor's concubine wasn't like you were a sex slave or anything, more like a live-in maid or secretary whose job also happened to include some stupping and a contract forbidding outside relationships, and you may not have been forced, depending on the emperor, just pressured into it at an age below that of consent. It's a subtle difference. But seeing as the emperor had 121 other women to fool around with, it's perhaps not too surprising that the two didn't spend much time together, save that one anecdote about Miss Wu telling him how to break a horse. But she did get to know the emperor's son very well. So well, in fact, that once the emperor was counting worms and she was told to get thee to a nunnery, the new emperor Gaozong rode out to find her and brought her right back to the palace. She was sort of like a stepmom to him, but if the emperor's into it, who's gonna stop him? And here's where the real fun starts. At the start of his reign, Gaozong was frequently too sick to do his job, which he wasn't too good at to begin with, meaning whoever whispered the most sweet nothings into his ear had a pretty good chance at passing along some words to the Empire. At first, that was his wife and his favorite consort, but, well, that didn't last long. Consort Xiao seems to have simply fallen out of favor, but it's a lot harder to take the place of the Empress. But Wu may or may not have had a plan, it's complicated. One night, while Wu and Gaozong's baby daughter was sleeping, someone noticed she was being awfully quiet, and, uh, yeah, they didn't have a baby daughter anymore. Now, some say this was a ruthless tactic by Wu to blame the Empress and take her position. Others say the Empress actually did it out of jealousy. And others say that using coal to heat a room with no ventilation is a bad idea. The facts of the matter are that the baby died of asphyxiation and Empress Wang took the fall. Gaozong's ministers weren't too happy with the idea of giving her the boot, but one of them eventually gave a I mean, it's your family, to whatever, I guess. And with the utmost conviction, the Emperor deposed his wife and his former favorite consort for some reason and demoted everyone who openly said it was a bad idea. And again, we hit a questionably hard core story where Wu Jiao, as she was called at the time, locked her former rivals in a dark room, cut off their hands and feet, sealed them in wine jars, decapitated their corpses, and changed their entire family's surnames. Or maybe she didn't, who knows. What we do know is that Emperor Gaozong got sicker, and while Wu's opponents were able to stop her from being named regent, they couldn't stop her rise to power. About ten years into her tenure as empress, she was literally running the empire from behind a curtain. People tried to stop her, mind you, there were all kinds of machinations going on in that court, but they ended with a lot of dead officials and or relatives. Oddly enough, the one person she seemingly hasn't been accused of killing is her husband, so even though he'd been in declining health for years, I feel it is my duty to suggest that his sickness was actually planned all along. 
I'm only kidding, of course, he's been accused of that too. So, now in need of a young, malleable new emperor, Wu Zhao turned to the crown prince, who was thoroughly dead because she had implicated him in a conspiracy to depose her, and his own father ordered him to commit suicide. Fine by her, he wasn't her kid anyway. So she turned to her oldest, no, he was poisoned ten years ago after being nice to her rival's daughters, her second oldest, nope, exiled then forced suicide, her third oldest son to be the new face of the empire, a perfect, suggestible, obedient pawn. Unfortunately, he was too suggestible and obedient because not only did he take orders from his mother, he also took orders from his wife and even his wet nurse at age 30. Unsurprisingly, he didn't sit on the throne very long until his mom had her generals physically pull him off of it, place him under arrest, and ship him off to exile. She then replaced him with her fourth son, to whom she didn't even pretend to give any power. He wasn't allowed in the emperor's quarters, wasn't allowed to talk to his officials, she didn't even bother with the curtain anymore, just whispered in his ear and he gave the order. Pretty soon she got tired of the charade, and Raizong didn't want to wait until he did something to tick her off, so she decided, here, let me just, th th there we go, new emperor in town, and gave herself the name Wu Zetian. She wasn't half bad either, even historians with a bone to pick had to admit she was a pretty good judge of talent within the court, and she took China's imperial exam system, basically an SAT or LSAT, but for nobles working in the government, and opened it up to everybody. Not that peasants had the time or money to study for it, but it's the thought that counts. She promoted Buddhism at the expense of Taoism, but didn't go all death to the Huguenots on anybody, so it's fine. Don't think the bloodshed was over, though. Zutian eventually got the better of the Tibetan Empire, suppressed some rebellions, ruled with the terror of secret police, nearly killed her youngest son. Oh, and she rebuilt this nice pagoda. But alas, torture, murder, fun time couldn't last forever and Wu Zetian fell from power in nearly the most ironic way possible. Several years into her reign, as she was passing 70, her daughter introduced her to a dashing young gentleman who quickly became her lover. He, in turn, introduced her to his brother. How he knew of his brother's skills as a paramour remains unknown, but again, if the emperor's into it, Time passed, Wu Zetian's health began to decline, and like a Sith Lord being usurped by his apprentice, these two are now the only ones allowed to see her, despite numerous attempts by court officials to get them demoted, which backfired in the accuser's deaths. It was only a few months before she died that a group of officials got together and said, oh no, I see where this is going, killed the two brothers, and gave the empire back to the demonstrably capable Zhang Zong. As mentioned, Wu Zetian died a few months later, and was buried along with some of the children and grandchildren who so graciously killed themselves for her. As was tradition, a monument was raised which listed all of her accomplishments, and it was blank. Yeah, already historians didn't like her because of all the murder and X chromosomes, so they wrote nasty, sometimes made up things about her, so future historians liked her even less. Just a vicious cycle, really. And the real victims are the modern historians deprived of reliable sources. And on that happy note, we now return to your regularly scheduled Tang Dynasty. Back to you, Blue. Thanks, Jack. Following, uh, that hot mess, China stabilized under the half-century reign of Emperor Oof. Uh, hold up. Emperor Xuanzong, who led China to become the dominant power in Asia. He caught tax loopholes, refurbished transportation avenues, and imported loads of cultural novelties from abroad. Not only was China in control of itself, which is a big ask historically speaking, but it was also able to project power in every direction by land and sea. Their biggest rival in the 700s was... Hmm... Somebody, as they were shaping up to be an imperial contender to Chinese hegemony. Whoever could it be? Nobody knows, their name doesn't exist. They tried to topple the Tang by teaming up with the eastbound Muslim armies of the Umayyad Caliphate, but the ensuing Battle of Aksu in 717 was entirely uninteresting in pretty much every regard, and nothing came of it. Xuanzong's reign continued on its merry way as China entered what was, by all accounts, a golden age. The state was just and unified, life was safe and prosperous, and culture was booming. There's not a lot more anyone could really ask for. In the realm of religion, the Tang took big steps to consolidate the tripartite Buddhist Taoist Confucian religion as a comprehensive and distinctly Chinese entity. Specifically, it was here that Taoist philosophy meshed so fully with Buddhism that it created what we now know to be the school of Zen Buddhism, where a mindful approach to life took priority over traditional notions of reincarnation. Really cool stuff. But of course, no golden age can last forever. A foreign-born general in the Tang army named An Lushan got in good with a family that itself was gaining more sway over the emperor near the end of his reign. When the Yang family decided that they didn't want to be friends with An Lushan anymore, he did the only reasonable thing and kick-started a revolt, murdering several members of the Yang family, forcing the emperor into exile, and generally firing up a horrifically bloody civil war that triggered a long decline throughout the ensuing Low Tang period. But hey, at least a civil war and then a long decline is better than a civil war and the whole thing falling apart for good? 
Silver linings, everybody! A decade after An Lushan's rebellion, the Tung Empire seemed on paper to have returned to normal, but really their military and political authority over the provinces was considerably weaker. Under the thin guise of imperial unity, the Lo Tung kinda looks like the spring and autumn period. There was an all-out war, but it wasn't happy unified fun times either. In the 870s, rebellions sprang up across the empire, and in 880, the rebel Huang Chao marched across China to topple the imperial capital of Chang'an. The city was sacked about a dozen successive times, and the Empire broke again for good in 907. That's the definite collapse we were looking for. Came a couple centuries late, but it always happens. The following century saw a somewhat flipped rehash of the pre-Sui world order. While the North followed a chain of five small dynasties, the South fragmented into ten kingdoms. It's honestly stuff like this that explains why no more than a quarter of Chinese history can be counted as unified. That's not to say that, again, people can't live good lives and cool things can't happen when there's no empire around. Early printing presses and maritime trade helped spread a more uniform culture across China, as opposed to the more common everything-goes-to-the-capital approach with most empires. The ten kingdoms in the South were fairly stable, opulent, and experienced a steady population increase, partially because of good food production and partially because of a broad migration southward by people not super thrilled with the dynasty carousel going on in the north. The five dynasties ended with the Song, who were ultimately able to put China back together again. And since tracing legitimacy is everything, their histories prioritize the dynasties over the Ten Kingdoms, ignoring how life was, by most evidence, way better in the south at the time. These new unifiers sprung into action when the later Zhou dynasty in the north was getting ready to court coronate a seven-year-old. So Emperor Taizu founded the Song Dynasty and set about reuniting China for the next 20 years, where they proceeded to strengthen the bureaucracy by actually, you know, making it meritocratic? Just a thought that crossed his mind. The biggest threat to the Song Dynasty was the Kitan Liao Kingdom to the north, which they dodged by recognizing them as an equal empire. Pretty embarrassing, but effective for self-preservation. On the eve of what was supposed to be a terrifyingly huge battle between them that would prove calamitous for the loser, they managed to strike a truce and even kick off a century of peace. Good going diplomacy. On the other hand, it did mean that the Song lost some face and had to pay tribute, and it brought up the unpleasant question of whether there could be two mandates of heaven at once for Chinese and non-Chinese empires. But in any case, this marks a transition, as Chinese history will become much more closely intertwined with the outside world from this point on. In the second millennium AD, China was a solitary civilization no longer. On domestic policy, the Song had a solid track record for progress and prosperity. In addition to social bureaucratic and educational reforms, there was fairly little threat of revolt, and new technologies like printing, the compass, and explosive powder found productive uses. The one unambiguously horrifying thing they did was institute woman's foot binding. Now, I like not throwing up at my desk, so I'm gonna skim through this, but basically, foot binding made eight centuries of women almost completely unable to walk because of how much pain they were constantly in, so it's possibly the single most misery-inducing mutilation practice in human history. Anyway, up in the Northwest, the Jurchens established the Jin Dynasty. Nope, nope, the other one. And invaded the Song Dynasty, capturing their capital of Kaifeng in 1127 and splitting China between the Jin North and the holdout Song South. While the Song got embarrassed by their truce with the Liao, their submission to the hegemony of Jin was outright humiliating. They went on for another century coexisting about as well as Song Wukong coexisted under that giant mountain, but the mutual distaste between Jin and Song wouldn't be a problem for much longer because right there over the horizon was Genghis Khan with an army of about a squillion mounted archers ready to kick ass, take names, and indiscriminately topple empires. Conquest is fun! So that's medieval China, from three kingdoms to two empires and everything in between. I think that even with China cracking open like a Russian nesting doll every other century, there's still a lot to appreciate about this string of eras that usually get dismissed in favor of stuff like the Warring States period or the Tang Golden Age. And joke as I may, despite political fracturing, the underlying Chinese culture had arguably never been stronger than during fractured spots like the Ten Kingdoms period. And as far as historical impact is concerned, I'd personally take a thriving civilization over a sprawling empire any day because keeping an empire together is tough, and honestly, so is coming up with unique sponsor tie-in jokes every episode. I'm kind of running out of ideas, but you know what's easy? Managing a website with Squarespace. If you have a project or a business, or perhaps a book that you're looking to promote, having a website can be an even bigger flex than inventing gunpowder. And Squarespace makes the whole process simple and affordable, especially if you start a free Squarespace trial at squarespace.com slash overly sarcastic and use code overly sarcastic to get 10% off your first purchase. Building a slick website for ourselves was easy because we didn't have to 
to worry about code, plugins, or updates. It's great for OSP because we're now able to collect all the different branches of our business from YouTube and Patreon to Twitter and merchandise all under one roof. My point is that everybody can benefit from having a cohesive digital presence. So to get started on your website, head over to squarespace.com slash overly sarcastic and use code overly sarcastic for 10% off. Thanks so much for watching. If you're in the mood for more biographical goodness, I highly recommend you check out Jack Rackham's channel. He makes some great videos for interesting characters all across history.